those who are here and those who are remote. Uh, the way this is going to work is that Eleonora is going to go first. She's going to talk about her book, which she tells me is 60% longer than the last oh, edition. That's obviously what I need to do. And no doubt will be another 60% of this size on the next edition. Uh, and then Nick Saunders, Lord Justice Arnold, and a sweeper at the back, Uma Sutha Simon. And we're going to stop it each time in the middle and have questions instead of one after the other. Let us press on. And then Laura, tell us about your book. And then we needn't <laughs> read it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if uh, the publisher would be content about that. <laughs> In any event, good evening, everyone. It is, uh, of course, uh, an, an honor uh, to, to be here tonight. So thanks so much, uh, Sir Robin and UCL, for uh, hosting and organizing this event. Um, I would just say regarding the book uh, that uh, um, the first edition was released in early 2019. Uh, and... Uh, uh, a lot has happened since then. Uh, there have been uh, some notable decisions of the Court of Justice that have been issued. Uh, I'm referring to the trilogy of uh, uh, fundamental rights focus uh, cases such as uh, Pelham, uh, Spiegel Online, Funke Media. Uh, there has been a uh, case law on uh, the treatment of originality and works of applied art, uh, Coffemel, Brompton Bicycle, uh, etc. And then, of course, uh, uh, cases on platform liability such as uh, YouTube, uh, as well as the challenge uh, to the very validity of Article 17 of the DSM Directive, which was decided uh, in uh, 2022. So a lot uh, of case law that has been issued by the Court of Justice, as well as a number of uh, external events uh, that also required uh, some, uh, some new work, uh, and that is the, the completion of Brexit. So indeed, uh, the fact that now the UK is free to disentangle itself from EU law and the case law of the Court of Justice, as well as uh, the adoption and transposition into national law of the DSM Directive, which has now been uh, done by most, but not all, of the EU member states. As you know, the United Kingdom decided not to transpose, but that does not mean that uh, interesting parallels cannot be drawn going on. Um, so um, in the time at my disposal, I would like just uh, to map what I think uh, are uh, five uh, top trends uh, that emerge uh, from uh, the most recent uh, case law of the Court of Justice. So I would start uh, with uh, the substantive requirements for protection. I would say that there is no doubt uh, at this point in time that uh, no definition of the foundational requirements of protection are to be found in uh, statutory resources. There is no definition of what a work is, who or what an author is, what originality does entail, and yet we, are, we have been able to fill the dots through the case law that the Court of Justice has issued quite consistently over a prolonged period of time, starting with the 2009 decision in InfoPAC. And insofar as the related consequences are concerned for works of applied art, um, as you know, there has been a, a lot of discussion across uh, the European Union regarding the possibility to maintain requirements other than original, such as artistic value, aesthetic effect, etc. And as also the decision in response clothing does correctly indicate, full compliance with EU law requires to drop these extra requirements. And that is also true insofar as categorization is concerned. Uh, which is, uh, of course, uh, a constitutive requirement uh, of the UK copyright system. And once again, it seems that this will be incompatible with what the Court of Justice uh, thinks uh, the requirements for copyright law uh, should look like. Fixation. This is a requirement that under the Bern Convention is uh, left to the discretion of individual Bern countries. Once again, in the European Union, this is no longer true because if we take the decision in Le Vola Angelo concerning the definition of work, indeed there the CJU seemed to adopt a EU-wide definition of what fixation should look like. Um, the final point that is perhaps missing is the definition of author, but for sure when uh, and if the opportunity arises, the Court of Justice we say that also the notion of author is an autonomous concept of EU law, which must be interpreted and applied uniformly across the European Union. 
Second trend relates to uh, the exclusive rights under copyright. Here we've seen a consistently case law adopting a high level of protection requirement, which in turn has led to an expansive reading of the scope of protection. Uh, in all these, what has emerged over the past few years is the following. First, there has been, there has been a progressive construction and refinement of concepts adopted in some cases. I'm thinking about linking liability of platform operators. There have been a series of cases decided by the Court of Justice, and through them, the CJU has not departed from earlier case law, but it has progressively refined, indeed, the treatment of certain areas. Let's think about links and the uh, cases uh, that have been decided in this sense, Svensson, GS Media, Vigibil Coop, <laughs> etc. Uh, and then I would say that another interesting aspect relates to the standard of infringement. Uh, correctly, I would say standards of infringement depending on the right at issue, but also the object at issue. If we take, for example, the right of reproduction, the Court of Justice seems to distinguish between the standard for copyright works and the standard for subject matter protected by related rights. While for the former, the logic is one of originality, for the latter, it is one of investment. Then moving on to exceptions and limitations, here I think that the most interesting trend is the increasing visibility of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights and in turn, the somewhat material abandonment of the criterion of strict interpretation of exceptions and limitations. The Court of Justice has progressively emphasized the need for a fair balance and the understanding that there is a horizontal relationship between copyright and exceptions and limitations, up to the point of calling exceptions rights of users. What that means remains to be seen, but it is quite remarkable that the Court of Justice uses this language. At the same time, while emphasizing the need for effectiveness of exceptions, their characterization as rights, the Court of Justice has also excluded that you can directly invoke fundamental rights outside the catalog of exceptions. So you must find a relevant provision under national law, and the three-step test is something that needs to be complied with. Then on the fourth level, I would say that if we look at what the European Union has been doing in the copyright field, a lot has been a reaction to case law of the Court of Justice. And that has been by means of codification or erasure of decisions that were disliked. I'm thinking about private copying, Article 16 of the DSM Directive erases, as a matter of fact, the CJU judgment in Reprobel. Article 17 concerning the liability of certain uh, internet platforms is not a codification of CJU case law, but goes somewhat in a similar direction towards greater responsabilization of certain types of platforms. Last but not least, and this will be, I guess, the topic of the rest of the discussion, if we look at what has been happening in the United Kingdom following the completion of Brexit, uh, there has been really no departure from the case law of the Court of Justice yet. Uh, if we look uh, at the standard of originality, that is perfectly in sync with what the Court of Justice uh, has uh, construed originality to mean. Skill, labor, and effort are out of the picture, for sure. It is uh, authors on intellectual creation, freedom and creativity, personality, and this has been reiterated also in more recent uh, decisions. And uh, when there has been uh, indeed the call to depart from the case of the Court of Justice that was done, for example, in Tunin, this freedom was not taken advantage of. So this leads me to conclude that if the UK, while having the opportunity, has refrained from going astray from what the Court of Justice has been saying for years, perhaps the TJU has not done such a bad job to compel one indeed to take a different direction. And with that, I conclude and thank you. Well, thank you, Eleanor. We, we don't need to read your opinion. <laughs> it's truly amazing. And we can have a QA and a now and, 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 and comments now, rather than and then we do it with the next speaker. Uh, yeah, Richard. Just a point of information, <clears throat> because not everybody in the room may know this, but Eleanor mentioned the question of fixation. And I was amazed in July 
to find myself in the Court of Appeal for the first time in my entire professional career faced with a real live issue on fixation, which was going to be decisive of the case. You don't encounter cases like that very often, um, as my own personal experience indicates. Um, it's a case called Wright and BTC Core, um, uh, and you will have to read it for yourselves to find out what happened. Um, but I think you will find that it bears out quite a lot of Eleonora's theses in her book. Nick. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, hang on. He's got some slides. I've got a slide. Here we go. Um, so I've been asked to talk about UK participation in CJU referrals. Obviously, this is of historical interest primarily, but um, let's um, let's have a look. So let's set the scene. Um, this is the Court of Justice in session, um, and actually, amazingly, hearing a copyright case. So um, it's very unusual to have a photo of the Court of Justice actually sitting. Um, this you is... tell it's a copyright case. Ah, oh, <laughs> so so the the um. Because obviously photography is not normally permitted. This is their press, it's one of their stock press photos. And by deducing who's there, this is one of the um, Grand Chamber. I think yes. this is from Comedian because we've got Tom Schaff for the commission who was one of the people that uh, was there as well. So um, it, it's, a, so it's an odd photo for two reasons. Firstly, because nothing actually seems to be happening in the photograph. <laughs> um, there's nobody at their feet doing anything. Everybody's just sitting around, oh, um, which I, when I think the Grand Chamber announces its judgments. The second reason it's slightly odd is that um, the UK government's representatives are there in the bottom left-hand corner. Well, more accurately, their papers are visible. But possibly as a result of Brexit, they have been cropped. <laughs> 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 so. Um, there we are. Uh, the French government agents are sitting just in front, looking rather more cerebral, perhaps, and that may be another reason why they didn't go for the UK. Um, but um, who have you got on the bench? So you've got um, the 15 judges, President um, Lennox in the middle. Um, on the right-hand side is Advocate General Spooner, who's um, one of the Advocate Generals who's heard a large number of, or been involved in a large number of copyright cases. And then around the court, you'll see all the translation booths that do the simultaneous translation. Um, so um, now, what, who member state interventions, who's done what? I suppose first just to talk about how member states intervene. Every member state has a right to intervene in whatever cases they choose to intervene in. They can do that in one of two ways, or three ways, in fact. They can submit written observations, they can attend the hearing or do both. Um, the, if you want to really put the cat among the pigeons as a member state, you just turn up for the hearing without telling anyone what you're going to say. Um, and that can get a lot of quite excited engagement from the commission um, amongst other people. Um, but but um, generally speaking, most member states will submit written observations. Not that many of them will go along to the hearings. Um, what you can see, this is um, taken from Eleonora's new book, Do Buy It. Um, it, it is uh, a chart that she's prepared which showing the different member state interventions and um, how frequently member states have intervened in copyright cases. Um, you'll see that the UK is, I think, the third biggest intervener in terms of frequency um, after France and Italy. Italy traditionally very rarely attends the hearings, um, but they do put in a lot of written observations. The French government rather more frequently attended the hearings. Um, and then after that, there's the UK. Um, the um, Germany is a very big referrer to the court, but doesn't attend so many hearings. So again, it's interesting to see that a lot of cases get referred, particularly by the German uh, Supreme Court, but the German government itself doesn't take such an active role um, it, it, before the court. There are three rapporteurs, juge rapporteurs, who particularly have been involved in copyright cases, um, J Judge Malinowski, Judge Ilicic, and Judge Lennox, who's the president of the court. Um, they, The juge rapporteur is actually very important because they're responsible for carriage of the draft, and that's before it goes to the big deliberation uh, amongst all the judges, and particularly in the Grand Chamber, that's mm -hmm. a deliberation with 15 judges. Um, and so sometimes a, a juge rapporteur can influence to a large extent, the way that some of the cases are decided. And as Eleonora was saying, there's, um, particularly through um, Judge Malinowski, there's been a lot of emphasis on the Charter of Fundamental Rights as it applies to exceptions and limitations of copyright and the balance to be struck there. 
And actually, extra ju judicially, he's given talks where he says pretty much all of those exceptions that you see in the Information Society Directive are all really manifestations of fundamental rights that you see through the Charter. And that creates something of an interesting conundrum when you look at that law through the lens of post-Brexit, where obviously we no longer have the, the Charter and we've kind of inherited some of that tradition and it's like rather different approach that's baked into the CJU case law and that's rather alien <laughs> on occasion to the way that the English judges and the English approach might might decide some of these cases. Um, and then the next slide I've just listed off some of the interventions that the UK made prior to uh, Brexit. Um, there were still a few, I think there, there were a few post-Brexit hearings, but I, I, the last one that I could detect in copyright is the Tom Cabinet case so that's the one about exhaustion of ebooks the grand chamber cases are in red um then there's Coffermel, there's pelham uh spiegel online and funk comedian pelham was um the metal alf metal case which was a, a case which bounced up and down through the german courts went to the german supreme court i think three times um and then um you'll see actually that the, you'll see the band there in black and white at the bottom right hand corner of the screen that's a case about sampling and what happened was Sabrina Settler, I think her name is, um, who's the lady in colour, just to the right, sampled a bit of her, the um, one of their songs, um, Metal Alf Metal, and used it in the backing of her song. The question was, was that a substantial part and was she entitled to rely on exceptions? So that's, so, so there have been a lot of quite fundamental issues that the courts had to consider, and it has been at the kind of cutting edge of quite a lot of technological issues. Lavola Hengelo is another interesting case about subsistence of copyright, where the court took a took a view which was quite similar to the um, approach that's been taken in relation to trademarks. Um, a case um, like Zeekman, which was about um, a trademark registration for a smell, which I think was balsamically fruity with a hint of cinnamon, was the application, and that obviously didn't work terribly well because it's very difficult to know what the um, scope of that registration, what the monopoly is. And the court were quite influenced by that approach as well, because they said that the requirement of uh, fixation does, to a certain extent, require um, a similar certainty about it. And so you see that in the Vola Hengelo. Uh, Ziggo, the Pirate Bay case, was another big one as well, which the UK intervened in. You'll see the member states who are frequent interveners through those, those cases. Pirate Bay was another striking judgment because none of the member states supported that being uh, communication to the public. And there were some very interesting questions in that case about um, secondary liability of copyright, um, but the court um, decided uh, to, 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 to rule that that was uh, nevertheless communication to the public. Um, there's also uh, the EFTA court. So the, the um, Norwegian board case was a case about um, the overlap between copyright that had expired and whether you could then obtain trademark rights. So that's the angry boy on the right hand side was a sculpture in a sculpture park in, in uh, Norway. Um, a series of different cases have gone through. Lending of ebooks is another one where the UK's intervention was very significant because that's led to, um, in large part, lending of ebooks um, and various private copying cases, Arsenal posters, and so on. And then working right the way back through to Svensson and Football Data Co and FAPL. So the UK has been at a lot of these. Um, uh, uh, kind of leading <laughs> copyright cases over the years, um, and generally has, I think, to, certainly, I mean, it seemed the court was quite receptive to having a common law approach and a, 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 a different philosophical approach to copyright, which you see through um, through through the English approach as opposed to some of the um, continental civil law countries. Um, Finally, I'll leave you with a, a slide for the EFTA court. So the EFTA court is <laughs> over the road in, um, in in Luxembourg from the Court of Justice. And um, on the wall in the, the, the courtroom is this wonderful installation, is Justice, Justice. And um, there we are, that's the final note in which to <laughs> summarise. Um, obviously, the UK can't make um, references anymore to uh, the, the, the European court. Um, the, the, the case law is no longer retained EU law. There are issues, very live issues in some cases, about whether um, new decisions are simply declaring earlier laws, uh, what the law was, if you're sort of finding, as it were, divining the, the law as it always stood, um, or whether they're actually introducing a change to the law. 
And that's come up a lot. Um, certainly one case which is on its way probably to the Court of Appeal has come up in, um, in relation to uh, the limitation period for competition claims. Um, because there have been some recent cases, there was a case called Volvo, which says that there are certain knowledge requirements and so on in relation to competition claims. That is a post-Brexit case, and there was a three-day hearing before the Competition Appeal Tribunal before Mr Justice Roth and Mr Justice Marcus Smith and uh, Ben Tidswell to decide whether that was in fact a new principle or whether it was baked in to earlier case law. And so I think you're going to see more and more of that coming forward that that case is worth a lot of money because if the limitation provision is one way then these are class actions and so the claim period is much much bigger depending on how the, the limitation is is construed but um i think uh, richard is going to talk a little bit about the change to the to the, the new act but there will be obviously a lot of issues coming forward and working their way up through the um, court system wow oh being so ancient, I was actually in the second reference to the court. It wasn't that building, it was another one. And I was led by the great Tom Bingham. So I went to imagine going to the court the day before because he was a bit nervous and he didn't know where he would stay. And we went into the mm. courtroom of that first courtroom of the European Court of Justice. And somebody said, oh, look, the seats have got ashtrays. And Tom said, if you have a job lot of aeroplane seats, you must take them as they come. <laughs> <laughs> now, questions? Challenges? Madalino, I have a comment for Nick, no? Yeah. And now, of course, you mentioned the Pelham case, eh? and then now it has been referred once again to the Court of Justice, asking whether a sample can be pastiche. And since yeah. the pastiche has been addressed in the UK, one of the few European countries where this has happened judicially, what do you think about the question whether a sample can be pastiche? And more importantly, what is pastiche? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll plead the fifth on the answer to that. But the, 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 I mean, the, the one thing that is interesting, just by way, so there are cases where on occasion people have cited decisions of national courts to the Court of Justice. On the whole, the Court of Justice is rather unimpressed by them, not because they're not well decided, it's just that they like to consider it their own body of law that they interpret. Um, what would be very interesting to see is whether actually they do pay an eye to subsequent common law decisions, because um, I think the court rather misses having the UK there because we were one of the only two common law jurisdictions that used to make submissions to the court. And so um, actually th those kind of cases can guide or give another perspective at least to the to the court when deciding things. So um, I, in a way, I won't answer the, 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 the question because I don't know the answer. But, but, but um, I mean, it, it'd be interesting to see if it is cited as, as a development of the law. I think it's going to be very fact sensitive, that isn't it? Yeah, well, well, you'll have to get listen to this here sample, and you'd probably have to know it and what it's being used for in, 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 in alleged infringement. But like, very, very fact sensitive indeed. Anybody who sits down and gives you a definition of pastiche is wasting their time, really. <laughs> because whatever it is, you'll be trying to interpret that, which is no more different, easier than going to the original word. Hello. Um, yes, yeah, so um, uh, I work for the government and I used to get involved in these cases from the government side. And um, we were always under the impression that the court was inclined to go with the European Commission. So as well as the member states, um, the institutions um, can intervene in these. And I think the commission in intervene every single time, usually. Yes, so the commi commission um, requires to, be, required to. to submit written observations in every hearing. So kind of at least the commission seemed to give the impression that they they think they will be followed um, when they turn up. It, it, do you know if that's the case or, you know, is, it, is there a tendency to go with them? or not? So, so it differs, but the part of the art of those hearings to a certain extent, was speaking to the Commission and negotiating a position with them, because to the extent that you can get them on side, then that can have a very deceptive influence on, on how they go. Because once member states and the Commission form a bit of a block, then the court really does get quite quite interested in the way that that works. Um, but um, yes, I mean, it, it, the, the Commission, I think, I think statistically, there is a paper by, um, is that Paul? 
Torrens, I think, and various other people looking at the influence of different member states and the Commission in, in different hearings. So I think the Commission, they have they plotted a chart where the Commission's spot is slightly higher than some of the other member states. So that, that would suggest, on their analysis at least, that the Commission tends to um, have the kind of deciding or not deciding, but a, a particularly significant voice. Um, but I don't think so I, I would entirely agree, um, based on my observations. Um, you can find cases where the court most definitely does not follow the commission line, and on the contrary, takes a completely different line. Um, but the commission is hugely influential, and particularly when there's anything to do with the history of the legislation. And a very good example of that is the Acacia case on designs and spare parts, where what happened in that case is actually quite remarkable because the commission, and this is my take on it, I emphasize, this is purely a personal opinion. Others will think other differently, I suspect. But my take on it is that the commission completely rewrote history on the travaux preparatoire. Um, and um, the court, accepted the rewriting of history by the commission hook like line and sinker and therefore came out with a result which um, on an objective reading of the travaux preparatoire you might think was not really uh, the right answer. Hmm. I, uh, I looked into the commission observations in uh, digital and online cases no? Uh, uh, through requests for information because of course they're not readily available online eh? and uh, uh, my uh, own observations are uh, that uh, when it comes to these types of cases, uh, the commission does not get followed by the Court of Justice. Uh, and I can give uh, three examples in this sense. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, linking cases. Uh, the commission said this should not be communication to the public. Uh, platform liability, uh, the, the commission insists that this should be a matter of national law. The Court of Justice disagreed, as uh, Nick recalled. And digital exhaustion, the commission said it does exist under the InfoSoc Directive, and the Court of Justice did disagree. So I would say that when it comes to these, perhaps uh, more important for uh, you know modern information society challenges, developments, uh, the commission tries to push a line that the Court of Justice does not seem to appreciate too much. I mean, the, the Tom Cabinet case on digital exhaustion was quite an interesting one because the, um, again, the, the UK government and the Portuguese government were arguing that there was exhaustion and most of the other member states disagreed. The commission was actually, as Eleonora was saying, much more open to, to that. And What's very striking about the Tom Cabinet reference was that the reference was actually extremely carefully written by the Dutch Supreme Court, because what it said, it made it very, very clear that the right holder had already had their compensation, their slice of compensation. So the, the question was, under those very specific circumstances, should they then effectively get a windfall or not, or should, they be, uh, should there be exhaustion uh, uh, on the basis of those facts? And actually, the way the court approached it was rather more kind of fundamental view, which is that this is just all outside the the, the scope of the Information Society Directive altogether. So, um, it, it, yeah, it, it was that was quite an interesting, quite an interesting uh, distinction between the way that the Commission approached things and, and the way the court then went about it. Right. Anybody else? No. Right. Well, Richard. Okay, so um, uh, I've been asked to talk about the continuing relevance of CJ EU copyright case law. I'm going to take the example of communications to the public. Um, and of course, the point of this is it tells you why you should be buying and reading Eleonora's book. Um, <laughs> And I can vouch for it, having um, read all actually, of it. As a matter of fact, we've got some heavyweights outside and you're not going to get out of this building. <laughs> 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 yeah, so as I was saying, I have read it and I can vouch for it. Um, so this is why it's all still deeply relevant. Um, so just a quick refresher for those of you who are not filling up to speed. So this all comes from Article 8 of the WIPO Copyright Treaty. 
Um, and never mind the without prejudice bit in the beginning of Article 8. Um, what it says is that authors of literary and artistic work shall enjoy the exclusive right of authorizing any communication to the public of their works by wire or wireless means, including making available. And then there's an agreed statement uh, that says mere provision of physical facilities for enabling or making creation doesn't itself amount to communication. But that's it. That's that's at the international level all you get. And it doesn't get much better when you move on, firstly, to the regional level. Uh, Article 3.1 of the Infosoc Directive um, says that member states shall provide authors with the exclusive right to authorise or prohibit any communication to the public of their works or by wire or wireless means, including making available. It adds on a non-exhaustion rule in paragraph three. Um, apart from that, you get a bit more in the recitals. So recital three um, says it should be understood in a broad sense, covering all communication to the public not present at the place where the communication originates cover any transmission or retransmission by wire or wireless means, not other acts, and then reflecting the agreed statement of Article 8 of the WIPO Treaty, mere provision of physical facilities does not amount to communication. Um, likewise, when you get to the domestic legislation, Section 20, communication to the public is an act restricted, um, and that means uh, 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 it includes broadcasting of the work um, um, and making available, uh, and uh, it says it's electronic transmission, but that's it. So, in other words, both at the international level, the EU level, the domestic level, the legislation is a complete blank canvas. It tells you that communication to the public is a restricted act. It tells you that it covers wire or wireless means. It tells you that mere provision of physical facilities isn't enough. But beyond that, it's guesswork. Um, and it's not surprising, therefore, uh, that we've had um, quite a lot of case law. And um, we start with the pre-Brexit case law, and we take as our operative date, of course, the 31st December 2020, which, as everybody knows, is not the date when the UK left the EU, but it's the date when that departure became effective as a matter of law. Um, that's to say the expiry of the so-called implementation period. And by that date, communication to the public had been considered by the CJEU in no less than 25 judgments, <laughs> including three grand chamber judgments and reasoned orders spanning a period of 14 years. So it starts off in 2006 with SJE and Rafael Hoteles. Uh, there was then a bit of a gap um, until um, the Organismos case um, in 2010, but after that, they started coming thick and fast. And you'll recognize yeah. many of the names of these cases, BSA case, um, the uh, FAPL case, that was a reference from the UK, of course, um, and then it, they keep on coming. Uh, so we have another reference in the UK in the um, TV catch-up case, that's number nine. And then we get famous cases like Svensson um, and uh, Reha, GS Media, the Pirate Bay case, which we talked about earlier, number 16, and it keeps on coming. Um, so, uh, um, uh, yeah, we've got, uh, sorry, Pirate Bay is number 20, actually. Um, uh, and then we've got the Renkov case with Tom Cabinet, which we've just talked about, and so on. So that's the position as at 31st December. <laughs> and then what I put on the slide is that between that date and the 21st of March, 2021, there was one more judgment, again, a grand change judgment, this is VG built. And the significance of the date of 21st March, 2021, is that was the date, uh, sorry, I seem to mix up whether it's the 21st or the 26th, it doesn't matter which, uh, I think it was the 26th. Um, that was the date on which the Court of Appeal gave judgment in the uh, Tune In and Warner Music uh, Appeal. And what the Court of Appeal held in that case was that the 25 pre-Brexit judgments and orders were retained EU case law within Section 6, Subsection 7 of the 2018 Withdrawal Act. And that meant that they continued to form part of domestic um, uh, law post-Brexit, and they continue to bind lower courts. That's Section 6.3 of the 2018 Act. Under the 2018 Act, as amended, 
um, both the Supreme Court and the Court of Appeal have power to depart from these judgments and orders, but only on the same basis that the Supreme Court has power to depart from one of its own precedents or one of the House of Lords in accordance with the practice statement judicial precedent back from 1966, which is very rarely invoked. So the Supreme Court does occasionally depart from its own precedents or House of Lords precedents, but it's very rarely and sparingly done. So far as post 31st December 2020 judgments are concerned, they those don't form part of retained EU law. They're therefore not binding, but nevertheless, uh, one can have regard to them. Um, that's section six, yeah. subsection two of the 2018 Act. And the question arose, should we depart from the pre-Brexit um, uh, case law? Uh, and the decision was not, and I gave six reasons for not doing so. One, no change in the domestic legislation. Of course, the whole point of Brexit is the UK takes back control. Parliamentary sovereignty is reinstated. Parliament is now free to legislate um, in a completely different way, but it has not done so. And indeed, there appears to be no appetite for legislating in the copyright field whatsoever. But there we go. Um, so no change in the domestic legislation. And then secondly, no change in the international legislative framework either. We're still under Article 8 of the WIPO Treaty. And if you look at the Court of Justice's case law, it has said repeatedly that Article 3, one of the directive should be interpreted so far as poss uh, possible consistently with the WIPO Treaty. And of course, under our domestic approach to, imp to uh, interpreting legislation in accordance with international legislation to which the UK is a party, we take the same approach. Next up, um, for the reasons that I've touched on a moment ago, interpreting communication to the public is a difficult task. There's no guidance in the legislation. And it's particularly difficult because of the conflict between the broad nature of the right of communication to the public on the one hand and the global and interconnected nature of the Internet on the other hand. And I pointed out that the Court of Justice had unrivaled experience in confronting this issue in a variety of factual scenarios and had developed its jurisprudence over time. It wasn't free from difficulty or criticism, but didn't follow that better solutions were readily to hand. Now, just pausing there. I'd like to come back to the statistics that Nick gave you earlier and supplement his statistics with some of my own. So in the course of my career on the High Court, I made 14 references to the Court of Justice. When you break them down, of that those 14, there was one copyright case, that's SAS and WPL. There were four trademark cases, and there were nine SPC cases. And it's not an accident that that's the way it breaks down. Um, I won't, I'll leave SPCs on the one hand, but four to one trademarks and copyright is a pretty good reflection of the relative rate at which you get copyright and trademark cases coming before the High Court. You get about four times as many trademark cases as you do copyright cases. Um, and that's on a generous view. Um, second perspective statistic is this. I've been in the Court of Appeal now since the 1st of October 2019. In that time, I've had plenty of patent appeals, plenty of trademark appeals, and a bunch more trademark appeals coming up later this term. Um, on Tuesday, I heard precisely my third copyright appeal. So that's three copyright appeals in over four years. Um, not only that, when you drill a little deeper, how many cases on communication to the public have I had in the cause of appeal over the last four years? One. One case. And that's tune in and warn. So when I talk about the comparative experience of the Court of Justice, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, they've had to deal with this issue time and again including multiple cases in the same year. I've had one case in four years. Um, next on my list of reasons, no academic consensus on these issues. Um, pausing there again, I would like to emphasize that I value very highly the contribution of academic lawyers 
to intellectual property law. Um, people like Eleonora on my left and Umar on my right um, have a great deal to offer. What about this academic? Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> you're, so, you're, kind of both, you're kind of both wrong. <laughs> so you're both, both judge in the past and academic now, but yes, point taken. Apologies. Um, yes, they've all got a lot to offer. Um, but um, this is a highly contested issue of, in the um, uh, academic community and for good reasons. Um, so there is no consensus to guide us. Um, likewise, when you look at the case law from the common law countries, well, that's not very helpful because their statutory framework is different and their case law is not exactly settled or consistent either. And that lead, takes you back to onto reason number six, which is if you scrap all of the Court of Justice's case law, then you're faced with start going back to the drawing board, starting all over again. And what would be the result of that answer? Massive legal uncertainty, particularly given the small number of cases we get in this country. So those re six reasons, it seemed to me that one shouldn't depart from the pre-Brexit case law. Um, then, of course, we had the question of, well, what do we do about VG Bill, which was not binding? So the view we took on that was that it was highly persuasive for five reasons. First off, follows from what we have just been saying. It was judgment number 26 um, on the same issue, uh, and the other 25 we had decided not to depart from. It built upon and further revived, refines the previous jurisprudence. It was a grand chamber decision, so therefore particularly authoritative. It was directly relevant to the issues in the instant case. And importantly, it addressed the relationship between the earlier decisions in Spence and Renkoff, which the judge in the High Court, Mr. Justice Bursey then was, had perceived to be in conflict with each other. Um, so that's where we stood as at 26th of March, 2021. Since then, we've had four more judgments from the Court of Justice on communications to the public. And this, again, emphasizes the point that I've been making to you. So um, just in the last two and a bit years, we've had four more judgments um, from uh, the Court of Justice. Um, including an important grand chamber judgment in Peterson, um, aka YouTube, and Siande. Um, uh, and I'm happy to tell you that notwithstanding the fact that the Oslo decision was given as recently as late July, Eleonora's book is sufficiently up to date to include um, that one. It's not in the table of cases, but don't be deceived. That's a mere oversight. When you look at the text, it's there, it's commented on. Um, so at the moment, at least on communication to the public, um, she's bang up to date, which is remarkable when you think about it. Um, but again, it emphasizes the conundrum. What are we in the UK supposed to do um, when we've got all this case law coming thick and fast down to the Court of Justice and yet domestic cases come along once in a blue moon um, in which to uh, reach decisions on these difficult uh, questions. So where do we stand um, right now? Well, as many of you will know, um, we're on the cusp of another change. So as we stand uh, as of today's date, prior to the 31st of December this year, um, it seems to me that the new Court of Justice case law would be unlikely to make any significant difference to the question of whether the Court of Appeal or Supreme Court should depart from the pre-Brexit case law, um, which is not to rule out the possibility of such an argument succeeding for other reference, uh, other reasons. Um, the new case law is, of course, a persuasive authority only, and exactly how persuasive it would be would inevitably depend on the issues in any case pending before our courts. But let's look forward to post 31st December, because what happens then is that the Rule Act kicks into fully into force, we understand. Um, some of it's already in force, um, it requires a statutory instrument to bring the rest of it into force, which has not yet been laid before Parliament, as, as far as I can see. 
but we understand that it will be brought into force with effect uh, from the 31st of December. And this does a number of things. So section four uh, abolishes the principle of supremacy of EU law in relation to any enactment or rule of law whenever passed or made. Now that's quite important for this reason, that supremacy of EU law was preserved in relation to the pre-Brexit legislation that was implementing pre-Brexit EU legislation. But that now goes. Um, then we have um, a, a, an interesting piece of semantics, which is that after the 31st of December, uh, we are no longer allowed to refer to e retained EU law. We have to call it assimilated law. Um, although the 2023 Act itself uses throughout the expression retained law, which is an interesting conundrum. So quite what we do when we're referring to the provisions of the 2023 Act, I don't quite know, but there we go. Um, that I suggest is window dressing, um, rather than substantive, but nevertheless, we will have to comply, obviously. Um, the meat of it, so far as we are concerned, is in section six, which makes some incredibly complex amendments to section six of the 2018 Act. And I've just pulled out for present purposes, the key ones. So there's an amendment stuck in that says, a relevant appeal court is not bound by any retained EU case law. Um, you see what I mean about the, the language used. So we will hence under forth understand that to mean assimilated law, um, except so far as there is relevant domestic case law, which modifies or applies the retained EU case law and is binding on the relevant appeal court. So tune in and Warner would be an instance of such a case, because of course that is applying the retained EU case law and will be binding on the Court of Appeal, although not, of course, on the Supreme Court. Um, but except insofar as we've got cases like that, then an appeal court is not bound by the retained case law. Then we've got a provision that says that in deciding whether to depart from any retained EU case law, the higher court concerned, and we'll come back to the definition of these terms, must, among other things, have regard to a statement of the blindingly obvious decisions of a foreign court are not unless otherwise provided binding. Well, yes. Any changes of circumstances which are relevant to the retained EU case law. OK, that's also in some senses a statement of the obvious, but what does precisely will be a relevant change of circumstance um, remains to be worked out. And then most importantly, of course, the extent to which the retained EU case law restricts the proper development of domestic case, case law, which is, of course, a key criterion applying the practice statement in the Supreme Court. Then we have a provision that says a higher court may depart from its own retained domestic case law. So that's a case like Tune In and Warner, if it considers right to do so, having regard, among other things, to the extent to which the retained domestic case law is determined or influenced by the retained EU case law from which the court either has departed or would depart, relevant change of circumstances and the extent to which restricts the proper development of domestic case law. And then we've got a constitutional novelty, which is that a court or tribunal other than the higher court may refer to the Supreme Court or appropriate appeal court one or more points of law which arise on retained case law and are relevant to proceedings before it if it's bound by retained case law and it considers the points of law are of general public importance. So in other words, you could have the High Court referring points of law up to the Supreme Court of Appeal or the Supreme Court. Um, and then the definitions, higher court in, means the Supreme Court and a relevant appeal court and the relevant appeal court and an appropriate appeal court include the Court of Appeal of England and Wales. So post 31st December, uh, we are into a brave new world where litigants are going to be um, finding out what the consequences of all of this are for their 
problems. Plainly, a key objective of these provisions is to make it easier for domestic courts to chart their own course in the future and not to be too fettered by past EU case law or past domestic case law applying um, the EU case law. And one can understand the rationale for that. Um, but on the other hand, one has to weigh that against the price of the loss of legal certainty and the difficulty that is presented by the statistics with which I presented you earlier. How realistically in a field like communications to the public do we do that if we get one case in the appellate courts every four years um, in circumstances when there's a continual flow of court of justice case law continually refining what it has said before? It's not an easy question to answer. Um, but there we go. That's the future. Thank you. When I came to the bar in the 1960s, there were just three reported copyright cases in the previous 10 years in all aspects of copyright. I'm not sure that the world is better for all this. Um, I'd ask, I've got my question, Richard, which is this. All that stuff they've written there, in the real world, if the European Court of Justice has decided something post Brexit. It's not going to make much business sense for the UK to have a different rule, is it? It'd have to be a very strong case to not follow what they've done. Well, that question divides into two parts. I mean, firstly, there is the political stroke commercial question, which essentially is a matter for government and for business and not for judges, which is, does it make sense for the UK to have a different rule as to copyright to the EU? And I'm not going to express a, an opinion on that subject because it's not my place to do so. But then there's a, the legal question, which is given the legislation that we have, what makes sense at, on the question of legal principle? Um, and on that, I don't think I can safely add anything at this juncture to what I've said in tune in a ward. My bet is that we'll never see this action come alive. <laughs> you heard it here first. <laughs> any question, any other questions? Yes. Mike. Thank you. In fact, I'm called Mike, so that's very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, in terms of the the busyness of the courts as they are, and um, the courts of the Supreme Court, that is, from a capacity perspective, dealing with the prospect of referrals on questions from the lower courts, in practice, what impact do you think that might have on the busyness of the, of the higher courts having to deal with additional questions coming in? Well, it's a very good question. Um, answering is not easy because it, it does depends, as I've already indicated, on the underlying level of mitigation. Um, but bearing in mind that these provisions apply across the board, so anywhere where there is some relevant EU law, these provisions are potentially uh, applicable. Um, and let's take an example which is dear to Robin's heart, um, which is VAT law, um, where you know, it's of huge and practical importance um, for obvious reasons. Um, it's all based in EU legislation, um, which has been domesticated. There's a vast amount of EU case law. There's a vast amount of domestic case law applying the EU case law, but there are still regularly cases coming before the courts raising questions in that field. Um, and yes, I think your question is a pertinent one. If there were to be lots of um, issues and references, it would have capacity implications, undoubtedly. 
Uh, another question. Well, why should a judge refer the question? We can just decide the whole case and let, let, get the whole thing go on appeal. I mean, this is just an option. He can decide it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's got as far as writing a judgment about what the point is and so on and so forth. Might as well send it and decide it. I, I don't understand this legislation at all. Or is the idea you refer it without deciding it? Well, yeah, that's the point. Yeah, you, know, you refer it without deciding it, it and okay. then it comes back. What's yeah. the point of that? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is written by... by... Hang on. No, no, we need a mic. We need a mic. To, to frame the question a little bit more succinctly perhaps um, uh, Richard you saw the benefits of a pre-trial reference in the Interflora case and, and perhaps that's a circumstance where you thought that the point would be determinative of the issues in the case to allow a lower court judge to make the decision well that's very true but um, as I'm sure everybody in the room appreciates, that was a very unusual um, uh, scenario. Um, and it's worth explaining a little bit. So I ref these were references two and three that I made to the Court of Justice. They were made on the same day. Um, and that was quite deliberate because there were overlapping issues. The Court of Justice regressively um, didn't pick up on that, and so they were dealt with separately by the Court of Justice, um, and not 100% consistently, but there we go. Um, so the two in question were L'Oreal and eBay, and Interflora and Marks and Spencer. Um, but to pick up on Ian's question, the context was that I'd had a full-blown trial in L'Oreal and eBay, found all the facts, um, um, was therefore in a good position to make a reference um, in that case from any perspective. Um, it might be said, and I think it was said at the time, that I was sticking my neck out a bit um, in the Interflora case by making a reference because that was done pre-trial. So the facts had not been found. However, first of all, as I say, um, it was very much a parallel case to L'Oreal and eBay in many ways, where the facts have been found. First of all, secondly, although there were factual disputes in Interflora, the, the basic factual matrix was not in dispute. So you had a sufficient basis for making a reference, given that the key questions were legal ones. Um, but although I did it in that case, that's the only time I did it. And I think... The, the, the view in the, in, in, the, in the domestic case law, and this is a view that I think is shared elsewhere in Europe, is you've got to be very, very careful before trying to make references to the Court of Justice before trial, because although it has the advantage from the policy's perspective that if they know what the law is, then they can direct, direct their evidence accordingly, it has a real problem from the Court of Justice's perspective because they don't know fully what the facts are. And trying to pronounce on the law without a full understanding of the facts is a recipe for um, bad law um, and bad decision making. So one has got to be very, very careful about making pre-trial references. It's the same, exactly the same we've had for years. You could a, a judge can send a preliminary point, decide a preliminary point of law in a, in a case. He wants to. Just doesn't happen anymore. And, the, and on the whole. The Court of Appeal already said time, time and time again, don't do it. I mean, you, you know, Don Hewan Stevenson was a preliminary point of law. Can't do it. Yeah. Um, you know, nobody ever knew whether there was a snail in the bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so, should we go on to Uma? Right. Uma. <laughs> If I'm not mistaken, I, I wasn't aware of the word change to assimilate it, but don't the Borg say that? <laughs> yeah, they go around saying you will be assimilated. Uh, and I, I, I'm just starting to wonder who the draftsman was who, who, who decided to change the word. Okay, uh, finally, an academic perspective. Uh, first of all, it's a fantastic book, Eleanor. So you need to point it over there, that's the... 
There we go. There you go. It's a great book. I read it. I also read it uh, for for two re for three reasons. One, because Eleanor very kindly asked me to come and say a few words about it, so I had to read it. Um, <laughs> And she also very kindly sent us free copies of the book. Um, secondly, uh, in order to do basically as all academics do, the first thing we do really, you know, you look at the bibliography, right? And you go down and right, she cited me. Great book, yeah. Uh, therefore I start the citation of her in my books. But thirdly, I was actually looking at it for the purposes of teaching. And uh, it, it is very, good for teaching, I have to say. It's very clearly said. Um, there are great diagrams and graphs in there. Uh, I don't, and, I, and I, during the wine reception, I am just going to ask you, you know, um, to, to uh, whether you're going to give a seminar on those graphs where you did the calculations. And I also came across one of the funniest footnotes ever. It's footnote 46 on page 147 for those of you who have it. And this is in relation to the coffee mill decision. I agree with what you say, you know, it, it was bleeding obvious. I mean, you could see it coming from info park onwards. Um, and, and the way a lot of people reacted with shock, horror to, to coffee mill was bizarre, but you put it so beautifully in the footnote. I considered such a conclusion unavoidable, I being a nerd. Although I also observe that the CJEU case law on the foundational requirements of protection under copyright appears to have caused in some people something akin to a perduring post-traumatic stress disorder. <laughs> so true, so true. <laughs> Excellent. So the footnotes are worth getting, you know, for the book. So just, uh, I was asked to do constitutive elements and I decided to do it uh, in, in a sort of mathematical way. Um, basically, this is it. Originality is free and creative choices, which is said in different variety of ways. What I have some consternation of, and, and perhaps you did talk about it in the book, and I wanted to know your views on it. Some of the discussion, especially by the Advocate General, seems to go towards looking at intention and purpose. And yeah, so this this is the tracing of it, and uh, you know it starts from Infopack, and and yes, I I remember Infopack so well. I remember when it came out because I had to do uh, for those of you who who don't know, I'm also the editor for the what is it European Copyright and Design Reports, and so I have to read cases. I have to read um, Sir Richards long cases and, <laughs> and summarize them for case notes. Um to know. And 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 Infobox struck me, but it wasn't just me. It was academics, um, to those who wonder why we exist. But it was Luke McDonough and can't remember who the third person was. And we were in a pub as all academics, you know, go to uh, after being academics. And we 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 were completely stunned by Infopark. We kept talking about the mandate and people were Googling on the phone, what exactly is the mandate of the CJU? Can they just take something from the Infosoc and completely lay it across the What have they done? They've behaved, in our view, like an English court, you know, making law, going outside. It was like a Lord Denning moment, you know? I don't have enough here. We're just going to expand it. And, and that was what Infopact did. And from that minute, you knew where they were going, um, I think. And then BSA comes about, which talks about, you know, um, GUIs and categories and et cetera. And you knew, ah, they don't like categories, do they? They don't like close categories. And that that was another death knell. Talking of death knells, by the way, as I told you, I, I'm an ECDR editor and I have to look up Furia, et cetera. And I've been and I always look for English first before the other. The word English for you know the language of the case has been removed. It's now Irish. <laughs> so it's French, German, Irish. I thought that was interesting. Then Pioneer came, so comes along, you know, and, and, and adds things like um, personal touch. I think one of the things I, I was also 
interested in the way you laid laid it all out because you know it's a very logical sequence. I wondered whether it was a logical sequence, but it is true that by the time you get to Kofamo and and um, Brompton, um, the, the the manner in which the grand manner in which the court states as it is settled law. And then they state it down. But the settled law is something that they've been doing since Info Park. And it's it's lovely the, the, the way they, they they present it to you, but but you shouldn't be shocked really. With football data court, of course, it goes into functionality, my favorite topic in copyright law, because I think we need a functionality doctrine. And it's coming in um via uh, things like constraints and, and, and it's linked to originality. And then it goes on, of course, to punk comedian. And this is the one which, it's the one case I'm not quite sure about, partly because of the Advocate General's opinion as, and also the court takes it on, whereby they judge a work. And I'll come to originality in a minute after this um, tirade on cases. Um, they talk about originality and cre creative and free, free and creative choices but go to the function of the work, the purpose of the work, saying if you're talking about this sort of informational works, how much creative choice is there anyway? And how do we look at the creativity of the author if they have to write such a report? It's quite German in my mind, partly because there are German cases previously um, you know, uh, when they have applied personal intellectual creation um, one case is called the attorney's brief. Um, the other one is bidding specifications. But the German court has come to the same view. If you look at certain sort of works, it's basically the nature of the work or the purpose for which that work is produced um, gives you a hint that there is no, and, and, and for the Germans, they use words like Spielraum. You know, there's no playing room within it for the creator to show the personality. And that's why I think Fagamidi goes towards looking at the purpose. Yeah, and, uh, and that's why I say that. Um, the ADO takes into consideration the intent of authors and the purpose of the work. Um, you have to draft it in a certain style. And I am, I, I think it's another factor you take into account. Uh, and we'll come to the multifactorial thing. So that's originality. Then you come to work um, and all the cases starting with FAPL, uh, and then, of course, we, we know Lavola. everyone talks about it, it's the cheesy case. And everyone's talked here about no fixation because of that. Um, you cannot have a, a work that is subjective. And, and, and does that mean that the fixation requirement is no longer required? It was a question mark. <laughs> See, there's a question mark there. Uh, and does it also mean, you know, categorization falls down as well? And so then you come to Covermel. And, you know, then you shouldn't be shocked at what Covermel and then Brompton Bicycle say with, with, with all these cases leading up to it. Covermel is also interesting for the sake of um, factors which you can take into account. And, of course, Brompton sort of repeats it and adds to it because there was an existing pattern specification as well. And... I liked what you said. <laughs> Neither Coffin or Brompton, of which there's lots been written, by the way. Um, Eleanor just basically said, bluntly put, nothing was really not put in. Uh, I agree. It was clear, the, the, the logical line. And then, this I wasn't expecting. There is a discussion towards the end of the book about Article 14 of the 29 Directive um, and the digital single market, it, a tiny little article, which I remember when it came out, we were surprised in the draft versions as well. What is it doing here? I, I, and simply saying a work of visual art, which is out there, you know, if it's reproduced, should not um, be given copyright protection unless it, um, unless you can see that is an author's own intellectual creation. And Eleonora takes this to say, which is really astounding, that it's almost um, a legislative codification of everything the CJU has been doing. 
So although they've been doing it, in my view, slightly outside their mandate, and I don't know whether anyone agrees with it, but I think they have been. Um, but that's why I say they've been acting like an English court in, in, in many ways. It's been codified under Article 14. And I, I, I think there's a debate on this one. But I think it's a really interesting debate. Um, so purpose, intention of author. The last thing which I don't see is the perception of the public. Does it matter whether something is essential or informational? And and one of these questions is really important if you're talking about works of applied art, which um, I've been asked to spe um, specifically focus on. And in works of applied art, the problem is, of course, the thing shifts market. It shifts from a museum, a gallery, into a general products market, and then it shifts back again into a gallery. I mean, go to the VNA, as I tell my students, um, where you see typewriting machines and Doc Martin boots. Uh, and, and, and manufacturers know this as well. And they do play with art galleries sometimes to put or launch new products so that there's a linkage with the art world, although it is a general product circulating the marketplace. Um, think of the way that 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 Chanel sometimes launches its handbag uh, or perfume uh, manufacturers launch particular types of bottle sizes and try to, 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 to you know, convince you it's artistic. So that matters as well in the sense that do we look in the perception public? It's something that no, I haven't seen in the copyright courts. I may be wrong, but it's something that came in the Dokaram case in relation to community design law. The other thing is, I think we are borrowing too much from trademark law. You know, but it could be because um of the fact that there is so much trademark jurisprudence. Um, um it so could much be because they don't know the difference between a copyright and a trademark. Huh? It could be because they don't know the difference between a copyright and a trademark. No. <laughs> I didn't say that. I no, I said <laughs> people on the internet online. It was him. <laughs> okay, so we go to what you asked me to to talk about. Works of applied art. I think you all know my view on this. Everyone on this bench, perhaps except Eleanora. Um. Well, I came to these thoughts reading your book. Oh. Well, firstly, I think everyone who wants Section 51 to be brought, so sorry, Section 52 to be brought back and to have strict demarcations between literary, artistic, la la la, and to completely analyze and apply Section 4 of the CDPA in a strict fashion, uh, cannot have read all the cases on works of, um, works of artistic craftsmanship or indeed on sculpture. And one thing I can see in the CJEU jurisprudence, which is why we shouldn't deflect from it, that's my whole point, don't deflect from it because there are tools within copyright law to deal with the problems of functionality and concerns of competition. Secondly, um, the concept of public domain, it's flexible um, as our concepts of functionality, et cetera. I think I'm coming to the point of, do we have to change the law? We, we may need to have it clarified by the courts, but do we have, need to have legislative um, changes within the CDPA? I don't know because it's flexible and my view, yeah, it's flexible. Y'all getting the word flexibility here? Yeah. yeah. Um, and also, in some ways, you can say the first instance court in Lucasfilm was pretty much similar to what the court, the CJU in, in Brompton was trying to say. Um, it's a multifactorial test. Take everything into account to come to your view as to whether or not something has originality. Mm -hmm. Do we change our originality test? Because... Um, there's a lot in the book about the skilled labor judgment and whether it's dead. And I think response and water royal well, case are interesting. And, and, and I've said it before, I empathize with the judges in those two courts because they had to straddle CJE law as well as UK law. And somehow find a way to say, 
it's okay under both laws. Unless we want to keep on making our courts and judges do that, i.e. go between UK law and say, it's all right, and it's all right also under CJE law, and whether my decision is right or wrong, it's all all right. But you can see a sort of existential you know, discussion between the two sets of law. And I just said, why not merge the two? Again, flexible interpretation. So the thing is, I don't think we should get rid of the originality or the, the discussion on work or functionality because if we take it out of UK law, we're stuck with skill, labor, and judgment. Is it time? Okay. They're wanting their drinks. I've just got one final question. Yeah. About two or three days ago, there was an announcement that somebody, I think, called the director of the not honestly named European Intellectual office, Property Office, how anybody can call themselves that when they don't do patents, I do not know. And he wants to float the idea that there should now be a European copyright law, full stop. It reminds me of Mr. Justice Asbury in the 1930s. He said, reform, reform, aren't things bad enough already? <laughs> what do you all think about a European copyright law? I think it's, it's, it's going to come. Is it a good idea or should we <laughs> stay where we are? Well, I'm going to answer that question with a different question, which, which in some ways comes back to what Uma was saying. So I think Uma was suggesting, um, and one can see the force of her argument, that we don't need legislative change in the United Kingdom because um, the courts are able to do the job. Um, to which I would repost, what about works of artistic craftsmanship? Yeah, this is a concept that comes from the arts and crafts movement in the 19th century. Why is it that in 2023, we're still having to ask ourselves whether something is or is not a, quote, work of artistic craftsmanship, unquote? Will, will, will you Morris approve? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean... So, sorry, can I just quickly uh, repost the repost? Um, it doesn't. It doesn't. If you look at all the parliamentary committee meetings and all those boring stuff leading up to the 1911 Copyright Act, at no point was there any reference to the, the arts and craft. Neither did that movement with, with Ruskin and Morris. None of them went to, to, to make, you know, um, a proposition that this is the sort of thing that should be in the law. It, I don't know where this fable came from. Well, Simon. In, in Hench and rest well. But, oh, it's, well, yeah, but you, it's, it's two different questions. One is, what's the what's the legislative history? And we know the legislative history, which is it pops up in a, in a draft up, out yeah. of nowhere. Yeah. Um, so, and, you know, it, but where did, the, where did the draft person get that idea from? They unquestionably got it from the Arts and Crafts movement. So it was one guy. One guy, exactly. <laughs> yes, my very point. <laughs> oh, um, I, I, I've told Sir Robin this. Um, the the way to get rid of section that that uh, works of artistic craftsmanship problem is to amend section four. Right now, section four says that an artistic work means. Um, just take out means and say includes. Well, uh, you could do that, but it, that's a, that's a legislation. Yeah. Now, I've got some questions. I have got some questions online. Ooh. <laughs> um, how does the UK, UK see the concept of work now? Anybody want to comment on that? I, I thought we may have practically answered it. You've got to have something defined because they, they treat it like trademarks. If, if, it's, if it's not in well, some way so, definite... So, so, so I can't give a short answer to this question because I've already given a long answer in the right and BTC judgment that I referred to earlier so if you want if you want the latest word from the courts of England and Wales on that subject you will find it in that judgment right next question does the UK UK see the concept of work like the EU's approach which focuses on originality or does it see the concept of work something separate from the originality requirement I refer to my previous answer <laughs> okay <laughs> so I'm afraid <laughs> The questions were answered rather shortly and very effectively. 
<laughs> and I think we're now going to stop and go and have a drink. At least I am. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very much indeed. Eleanor, thank, thank you for, uh, not, I may not just setting this up and making it happen, but for really putting a, yeah, a mask on. Yeah, 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 it's good. And, and, I did check everything. Okay, folks. And it's true, he's right. Yeah. <laughs>